Bible Church. Can you hear me? We normally on uh, Advent Sunday have specific testimonies um, each week, and we're going to do that the next few weeks. But this is Thanksgiving weekend, and so we're going to give you an opportunity to give thanks in the midst of the congregation. Uh, let the redeemed of the Lord say so and all the great Old Testament psalm admonitions to praise God. And so for the next few minutes, I'd like to open the floor to anyone who would like to give thanks for uh, God, family, weather, um, debt, um, problems in your life, whatever God is doing, uh, you have an opportunity to do that. So who will go first? No. Because <laughs> yeah. if you don't go first, I'll pick someone. Oh, my goodness. We got a, we got a microphone right here, so y'all can come up and little Texas lingo there. Yeah. Oops, sorry. Yeah. I was going to start and say, so. <laughs> when he said, let the redeemed of the Lord say so, I just wanted to come up and say, so. Yeah. So. Anyway, um, <laughs> like I'm it. so thankful that uh, God has chosen us. And uh, from before eternity, or not before eternity, but before the world began, it's just remarkable that he saw us in, in what was not really his future, but said, that one's mine. Amen. And just what an amazing blessing and wonder that is. And just, I hope we can all have a sense of that privilege and amazing feel. So, anyway. Thank you, David. Appreciate that. Excellent. So we had lots of hands. Robert. Rob. I'm neither Robert or Rob, which I'm You're Rob, bed right whether my mom's mad at me or not. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to praise our God. He's the God of all situations. And whether we're up, whether we're down, uh, whether we're, you know, whatever situation we're in, he is there. And even when we don't think he's there, he's right there. And I just praise him. And, and I'm so thankful for this season as we, as we look to our Savior. And uh, uh, just uh, what a blessing it is to be part of this family here. And praise God. And we're glad you're well. Uh, Rob's been <laughs> recovering from surgery, and God has served him well. Greg? I just want to say that I'm thankful for uh, the life group my parents are in. From last year, everybody knows I came up here several times. My father was in the hospital. Um, we almost lost him. He's here today. Mm -hmm. He's doing much better, and I'm just thankful for that. Thank you. And he was in the, in the hospital again Thanksgiving. <laughs> yeah, praise God. Yeah. Okay, who's next? I just want to thank God for using me in all my struggles and all my challenges that I've had to face in the last few years and for my most wonderful husband for always sticking by me and my family and all my friends and all my care groups. And I just praise God for all he's good. Amen. Thank you, Robert. Yeah, the Bible says, he who finds a wife finds a good thing, but I guess it goes both ways. He who finds a husband finds a good thing, too. Yeah. Other praises of Thanksgiving this morning? Good stuff. Mention life groups and how important life groups are. A um, couple more weeks of life groups, and we take a break for Christmas, but uh, they're uh, very important. Okay, we're going to take uh, just a couple more before we get into God's Word. Tim, good to see you. See you. I just wanted to thank all of you that don't know me. My name's Tim Matheson. I had cancer for about a year and a half, and um, the doctors diagnosed me with stage four. I was supposed to die well over a year ago, and, and I just wanted to say thanks to God for delivering me and, and bringing me to him, and it's through trials like this that, uh, that I have met Jesus and and just wanted to say I've met so many wonderful people through this whole process. And a lot of you don't know who you're praying for, and I'd like to put a face with it. So thank you. Thank you, Tim. There's actually a lot of that going around here. You know, you're supposed to die a year ago and still living. We have several in that category. So uh, praise God for his blessings. We have time for one more here. We, I know we want to... Pam. This is from the Lord. Good. I want to say thank you for, to Ben oh. and all our staff here that keep Valley Bible running and keep us praying and leading us in the right direction. Thank you, Pam. 
Well, and my thanksgiving would be for Valley Bible Church in that uh, God and his kindness for some reason allowed me to be the pastor of this fantastic congregation, and it is indeed a pleasure to, to be part of the staff here. So praise God for, the, for all those things. Would you please uh, pray with me before we look at God's word this morning, and let's uh, go to the Lord and ask his blessings upon what he will say to us. We know, Lord, that you speak in your word, and you have spoken in these last days in your Son, and he has spoken through the apostles and the prophets. We thank you that Christ Jesus is the cornerstone of the church, to some a stumbling block, but to others a stepping stone to to faith and to heaven and a right relationship with you. And so we give you thanks this morning for your incredible love to us that we would be Americans, that we would be chosen, as David said, that we would be experiencing today your incredible love and grace and mercy in our lives, that we would be able to worship freely and that we would be able to listen to what you have to say to us as we go into this Christmas season, Father, Help us to keep our focus. We feel it already. We're being drawn into um, uh, the commercialism of the days that lie ahead. Father, help us to focus. Help us to keep our hearts pure before you and to worship the newborn king. So to that end, we pray that your word would help us to do that today. In Jesus' name, amen. Luke chapter 17, we're going to read this morning, verses 1 through 19, Luke 17, 1 through 19. We are clipping along here in the book of Luke, and uh, we will soon be into um, the last part of Christ's life, but uh, we've got some more instructions that come our way, and I'd like you to stand as we read God's Word. We believe that His Word is true, and that He speaks to us this morning, and His Word is a lamp unto our feet, and so I ask you to please Give attention to the reading of God's word, Luke chapter 17, verses 1 through 19, the word of God. He said to his disciples, it is inevitable that stumbling blocks come, but woe to him through whom they come. It would be better for him if a a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea than that he would cause one of these little ones to stumble. Be on your guard. If your brother sins, rebuke him, and if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times a day and returns to you seven times, saying, I repent, forgive him. The apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. And the Lord said, if you had faith like a mustard seed, you would say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Which of you, having a slave plowing or tending sheep, will say to him, When he has come in from the field, come immediately, sit down to eat. But will he not say to him, prepare something for me to eat and properly clothe yourself and serve me while I eat and drink, and afterward you may eat and drink? He does not thank the slave because he did the things which were commanded, does he? So you too, when you do all the things which are commanded of you, say, we are unworthy slaves. We've done only that which we ought to have done. While he was on the way to Jerusalem, he was passing between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, ten lepers, leprous men who stood at a distance met him, and they raised their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they were going, they were healed. One of them, when he saw that he had been healed, turned back, glorifying God with a loud voice, and he fell on his feet at his feet, giving thanks to him, and he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered and said, were there not ten cleansed, but the nine, where are they? Was no one found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, stand up and go, your faith has made you well. And God's people said, Amen. Thank you, and please be seated. Well, it is indeed uh, Advent season, and uh, the first Sunday of Advent. It's hard to believe that Christmas has come so very, very quickly. 
Our theme is Come Thou Long Expected Jesus from the song that we just said, the great old Christmas hymn. And Advent, of course, means that the, the coming. Uh, Christ's first Advent was when he was born in a manger on Christmas morning. And then, of course, we look forward to the second coming, the second Advent. So we're in between uh, the first Advent, the first coming of Christ, and the second Advent, which is his coming again. So the time that Jesus was teaching his disciples and lived on the earth, everyone was looking forward to the Messiah. Some realized that he had come in Jesus of Nazareth. Others were still wondering, is, is this the expected one? Now, what were they expecting? And what do we expect when it comes to Jesus and his coming? There was a lot of speculation. There was a lot of expectation. Uh, those who knew the Old Testament scriptures, they were looking forward to uh, uh, many a political ruler. They were looking forward to a kingdom. They were looking forward to those who read very carefully the books of, uh, book of Isaiah. They were looking forward to someone who would bring healing and prosperity. But they didn't really have a very clear picture of who was coming. In fact, even John the Baptist had doubts. You may remember back in Luke chapter 7, um, Jesus was becoming more and more popular, and John was in jail, and he sent some emissaries to Jesus. And, and remember, he had baptized Jesus. And he sent some to Jesus, and he said, are you the expected one, or do we look for someone else? Are you the expected one? And remember what Jesus said? The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Blessed is he who does not take offense at me. The fulfilling, fulfillment of these Old Testament prophecies that when a Messiah comes, he will bring healing and prosperity, and he will bring uh, change to people's lives. Uh, the dead will come back to life, and the lepers will be cleansed like we just read, and this is one of the signs that, yes, he is indeed the Messiah, and the kingdom of God was in their midst. So he was saying at that time, yes, I am the expected one. And you can know that by all the things that you see that are happening in my life. Interestingly, he says, blessed is he who does not take offense at me, who is scandalized. We're going to look at that word in our text this morning. So then they were expecting something. They weren't quite sure what it was. Now we're expecting him to come back again. And just as there was a longing and a groaning for someone to come and to be a deliverer, so there is today. I mean, don't you feel that sometimes? I mean, don't you just sense we, we need something? We need a savior. We don't need a president. We don't need a prime minister. We don't need a king. We don't need a better mayor, a better governor, or better congressman. We need a savior. Don't you feel that? And yet, oftentimes, we, we think that we can just fix the world we're in and it will be a better place. Yeah, we have to live in a certain way until he comes back, but what we need is the Savior. That's what we need. Not some political ruler who's going to do something for us. So in the meantime, how do we live in the expectation of his return? If he is Come thou long expected Jesus. He came to earth the first time to die for our sins. And, and so we've got that part squared away. He's coming again. Is it over with? Are we just, we just wave? We just bide our time until he comes back? Or is there something that's required of us in the meantime? Of course there is. We need to live distinctive lives of discipleship and holiness. We need to live lives of kingdom principles. We need to live lives that are expectant and faithful. And we need to live thankfully for all that he's done and that's what he expects of us and that's how we live out advent today we live expectantly of the coming christ that he could he could come at any time and your soul could be required of you as we've seen in the book of luke so the first part of the verses that we read this morning seem to be all these unrelated sayings but they all have one thing in common they're spoken to his disciples they are things that we must be mindful of because they are required of us. And so these are the things that the way in which we live in expectation of his return. And so let's look at these one by one. And the first is 
be watchful of error. Be watchful of errors. He said to his disciples, it is inevitable that stumbling blocks come. He is speaking to his disciples. In the last few chapters, we've been been going back and forth. Disciples, Pharisees, disciples, Pharisees, disciples, Pharisees. He's speaking to his disciples once again. And so he's speaking to us. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you are a disciple. He is speaking to you and he says, watch out. It is inevitable that stumbling blocks come. Stumbling block is a, is a uh, uh, the, we get the word scandal from this, scandal on. In fact, when Jesus said back to, when he was talking to John, uh, blessed is he who does not stumble or take offense at me, who's scandalized by me. We, Jesus can either be the stepping stone to our faith or he can be a stumbling block. You know that, you bring up the name Jesus, people fall flat on their face. I don't want to talk about Jesus. That's the, yeah, it's not the greatest name always to those who don't believe in him. They take offense at his name. But here he says, he's talking about stumbling blocks in a different sense. Uh, uh, the word stumbling block, scandal, was a word that meant a trap. So when you lay a trap for a bird or a beaver or a muskrat or whatever it is, you put it in a way that it's, it's not going to be easily seen, and you just, when that trap snaps, it's got its prey. Scandal on, stumbling block, is an enticement to sin. It can be any kind of enticement to sin. This, this trap, that thing that causes us to do something that is contrary to what we believe and how we know we should be living. And he says it is inevitable that stumbling blocks would come. And I think he's talking about more than just a, an enticement to sin because of the way he talks about woe to those through whom it comes. And in the context, he'd been talking to the Pharisees, and they were teaching falsehood. And we see this in the rest of the New Testament, the way the word stumbling block is used, often of false teachers. That there will come those who will be stumbling blocks to your faith, and they will lay before you teaching that is, that is false, that if you're walking along and not paying attention, you're going to trip over it, and you're going to hurt yourself spiritually. Beware, watch out for that. In the same sense, he's talking about enticement to sin as well. So he's talking about two things. He's talking about enticement to sin and falsehood and error, but he's also talking about the people through whom they come. Watch out for stumbling blocks. They're going to come. It's inevitable, and there will be many of them. It's not just one that you will face. It's not just one uh, temptation to sin. There will be many, but woe to him through whom it comes, the person. So in other words, many of the enticements to sin that we face in life will come through people. He's not say, he didn't just say, hey, watch out for pride, watch out for alcohol, watch out for greed, watch out for immorality. He says, watch out for the people through whom they come. Oftentimes, enticement to sin comes through people. And how serious is this? He says, woe to those through whom they come. It would be better if a millstone were hung around their neck and they were thrown into the sea. Do you, have you ever seen the picture of a millstone? That large stone that is the grinding stone on top of another stone and then the oxen turn it because it's so large and it grinds the, the wheat to a fine powder to tie one of those around your neck and throw you into uh, deep water, there's no hope of escape. But what he's talking about is he's saying it would be better if they died because there is a greater judgment for those who cause others to stumble in their faith or who lead others into sin. There is a judgment for falsehood and for error. This is serious stuff. The stumbling block himself causes serious damage to those who stumble, and that stumbling block himself will be severely judged by God. Many of them will come, and there are going to be all sorts of temptations that come our way, right? I mean, we all have things that we stumble at. Uh, The greater judgment for this person is beyond physical death. One of the passages that we used last week uh, in talking about hell, Matthew 13, 40, 
Jesus said, so just as the terrors are gathered up and burned with fire, so shall it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send forth his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness, and they will throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's a horrible picture. Because they are causing, he says, these little ones to stumble. Now, he doesn't say who the little ones are, but we can assume that he's talking about disciples who are young in their faith, disciples who need to be taught truth, disciples who need to be taught the purity of what the Word of God teaches and not falsehood, because when you have someone who is a new believer, you can tell them anything, right? And we have a responsibility with young disciples to teach them the truth of the Word of God that has been handed down from generation to generation to generation, the faith once delivered, that body of truth of orthodox teaching, and it's our responsibility to to hand that on from generation to generation. And if there are those who cause young people, young believers to stumble, you can be an old person and a young believer, woe to them. There's a greater judgment. So we're talking about a high standard of holiness. I think verse 3a, the first part of verse 3, where he says, be on your guard. I think that goes with the first two verses. Be on your guard. Watch out. Watch out. So here are a couple lessons. Are you a stumbling block or a stepping stone to others' faith? What are you? Are you a stumbling block? What kind of example do you give younger believers? Do you give them the okay, the green light to gossip? Do you give them the green light to be angry? in your behavior, in your words, in your actions, in your attitudes? Do they see Jesus or do they see a person who says, no, it's okay, to, you know, you, 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 let me tell you something about so-and-so. What kind of example do you give younger believers when they look at your life? Are you a stumbling block or are you a stepping stone to show them how you really live the Christian life? your words, your behavior, and your attitude, because those temptations will come. Second of all, is there a person in your life who is a stumbling block to your faith? Are you in a relationship? And I don't mean just romantic. It could be romantic, but are you in some kind of relationship? It could be a friendship. It could be a partnership. You could be in business. You could be um, I don't know, there are all sorts of relationships that we have in life, but are you in a relationship that is a stumbling block to you? That when you're with that person, you act a certain way, you, you're, you, you're crass, you're gross, you're, you're uh, out of control, your language changes, they entice you to alcohol or drugs or immorality or cheat or to lie or to steal. Are there people in your life that when you spend time with them, that's where you go. I think you know the answer of what you do to the, if that's a, re, a relationship in your life, right? It has to go. Or you need to change. You need to become a stepping stone because the, the flip side of that is you are a stumbling block to them if you do not say anything. If you do not live in holiness before that person, then you become a stumbling block to them. And so, this is a, a great warning to all of us about stumbling blocks. And there's going to be enticement to sin for all of us, and it will always be there. There will be many enticements and temptations to sin. Yesterday, Tara and I were talking about this, and it's kind of a funny example. But anyway, we, the kitchen garbage was sitting by the kitchen door and was supposed to be go, go, I was supposed to take it out, you know. And we're talking about this passage, and somebody let our two collies in, and they go up to the, to the trash, and they start sniffing at it. And Tara said, get away from there. And I, I said, we need to get that trash. She said, no, they need to learn to say no. <laughs> that's, the way, that's the way sin is, isn't it? It's always going to be in front of us, and it's trash. And we need to learn how to say no. It's not going to, I mean, removing the temptation, yeah, that's appropriate at, at times. But 
stumbling blocks are inevitable, plural. They will come. We need to say no. So how do we live in expectation of his, of his return? We need to be wary of error. We need to be on our guard for it. But second of all, we need to be forgiving of others. In verses 3 and 4, he says, be on your guard. And I think that word goes with both of these warnings. He says in verses, verse 3, if your brother sins, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times a day and returns to you seven times saying, I repent, forgive him. We are responsible to one another. We are responsible to confront sin and we are responsible to forgive sin. We don't live in isolation. We have an opportunity and we have a responsibility that when another person is in sin, we talk to them about it. Why? Because we love them. He says, if your brother sins, do you think he will? We could say, when he sins or when she sins, rebuke that person. We have a responsibility to point out sinful behavior to another person. We have a responsibility. That's not easy. In our culture, we have a culture. What's the first thing that someone's going to say in our culture? Well, judge not, lest you be judged. I mean, everybody knows that verse, right? Unbelievers, everybody knows Judge not lest you be judged. They don't know what it means, but everybody knows it. More people know that verse than they know John 3.16, right? So if you are confronting someone who's in sin, are you, are you judging them? Yes, of course you are. But you're judging them by God's standard, not your own. You're judging them by the standard of holiness that is found in God's word and the holiness of Christ, not by, you're not judging them according to yourself, you're judging them according to the standard that God has given to us, and that's very important that we know that. But we are to rebuke that person. In fact, we can say at this point that we are directed by Jesus Christ to rebuke others when they're in sin, right? We're directed by Jesus to do that. If he repents, it says, and it's assumed by Jesus that he or she may or may not repent. He says, if they repent, forgive them. Two responsibilities, confront and forgive. Confront and forgive. But then he goes on and he turns up the heat. If he sins seven times a day against you, and he returns to you seven times saying, I repent, I'm sorry. You, you yell at your wife, I'm sorry, we forgive you, I forgive you. An hour later, you yell at her, and say, oh, I'm sorry, will you forgive me, I forgive you. An hour later, you yell at her, oh, I'm sorry, will you forgive me, yeah, I forgive you. I mean, who's going to say, are you really sorry? Come on. I don't see any fruit to this repentance. I mean, isn't that the obvious question? How can someone sin seven times in one day and be genuine in their repentance every time that they come back. Can they? The point that he's making is the extent of our forgiveness to others is unlimited. And I think he's speaking in a hyperbolic way here because it's probably not going to happen that someone's going to come to you seven times in one day and, and continually say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Was that seven? I don't know. But it's a lot, right? In Matthew, Peter said to Jesus, how many times should I forgive my brother? Seven? And what was Jesus' answer there? Uh -huh. Seventy times seven, which means there's no limit. You don't keep track. There's no limit to our forgiveness of others, and that is the point that he's making. He uses the extreme case of seven times to make the point that there is no limit to our forgiveness of others when they genuinely repent. No limit. Two lessons. God's way is that we always resolve differences as brothers and sisters in Christ. Always. The goal of confrontation is restoration. It's not to hurt someone or to anger them. 
It is to restore them. In God's way, when we have a difference with another person, it is always resolve and re- restore the, rest of the, the relationship. This is talking about broken relationships in the body of Christ, and we have a responsibility to keep them together. And when that relationship is broken by sin, we have a responsibility to fix it. And when we don't, We're in sin. To not do so, to confront someone and forgive them, or to forgive them if they've apologized, to not do so is disobedience to Christ. To not forgive someone who has apologized to you is sin on your part. To not forgive them is sin on your part. And the main lesson seems to be the extent or the volume or the measure of our forgiveness One must forgive another one, even if those offenses are numerous. Why? Because it mirrors God's forgiveness of us. How much has he forgiven you? Most of it? A lot of it? The bulk of it? All of it, right? And that is the extent to which we forgive others when they have sinned against us. The second lesson is an important one, I think, at this juncture for us to remember You don't have to confront people every time you're offended. I know this happens in uh, Christian colleges all the time. You know, the chapel speaker comes and he says, when you, if you've been offended, you need to go to that person and you need, to, you need to confront them about their sin. And so for the next week, the college campus is in disarray because everybody, you know, uh, I'm mad. You looked at me in uh, the uh, um, cafeteria line wrong and I need to confront you about that sin because I'm your brother and we need to get this thing right. And it's like, what? We don't have to confront everyone about everything. Love is patient. Love is kind. And love does not take into account a wrong suffered. There's something in the Christian life called forbearance. And most of the time that we are sinned against by another person, you know what you do? You eat it. Honestly, that's what you do. Most of the time, when someone offends you in some way, eh, it's not important. I mean, if it's going to break your relationship and they're not talking to you and it's serious, yes, you need to go to that person and say, hey, let's talk. Uh, Something's wrong here. We need to fix this. But, uh, you know, uh, if someone says something in passing, they look at you wrong in the foyer, you know, they step in front of you getting coffee, we need to talk. You don't have to talk about everything. We are in a forgiven relationship with God. You you stand forgiven, right? The blood of Christ continually cleanses you of all unrighteousness, and we should go to him, search me, O God, and know my heart, and try me, and see if there's anything that I need to confess to you because my relationship with you may be broken, I may be out of fellowship, but when you come to God daily and ask for forgiveness, do you really think that you've got it all? Do you really think that you've named every sin in the last 24 hours? Is God up there going, well, you missed a few, and so not until you really repent, I'm not going to really forgive you. He doesn't do that, does he? And that's the way we treat one another in a way that is, like Paul said in in Ephesians 4, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has forgiven you. And the reason I bring that up is because Jesus' words here, he says, if your brother repents, forgive him. And I know for some of you, that's a loophole. You're already thinking, well, they didn't repent. So I've got a right to be angry. I've got a right to hold on to this until they repent. There are no loopholes. We are to be kind to one another, forgiving each other just as God in Christ has forgiven us. How did he forgive you? Completely, instantaneously, 100% for all of eternity. If a, if a relationship is broken by sin, yes, get together and talk and confront and repent and restore, but you don't have to rebuke everybody for every little thing that comes up. So, we are to be forgiving of others, living in expectation of Christ. The next, 
we are to be dependent on God in our expectation of the second advent of Christ. In verse 5 and 6, the apostles say, Lord, increase our faith. And I think this is in response to him saying, if that person comes to you seven times in one day, and they say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And they're genuinely sorry all seven times. Forgive them. And then the apostles go, oy vey. Increase our faith. I don't, I don't think I can do that. I don't think I've got the patience. I don't think I've got the love in me. I don't think I've got what it takes to forgive someone that many times. And you know what? You don't apart from Christ. That's why we have to be dependent upon God. The, the apostles say, increase our faith. Now, who is the original audience? The disciples. Remember, Jesus has a large following of disciples, but he's got the 12 who are the apostles. These are the leaders. These are the future leaders of the burgeoning church in Acts 2. The, the church, the, the, the leaders that they're going to take the church to, to Jerusalem and Samaria to the uttermost parts of the earth, right? Those guys, great leaders. Suffering for the faith. They will all die uh, being persecuted for their faith. But right here, they're timid. And their faith is small. And right now, they are not the men that they are going to be we have a picture of these future leaders of the church who are incomplete in their faith. In fact, they have a few failures ahead, right? I mean, we're talking about these disciples, these apostles now. They're not the apostles of Acts 2 and beyond. These are the apostles of Luke 22, 23, 24, who run away, who deny him, who doubt when he rises from the dead, who don't go to the grave, but the ladies do. These are the apostles, the leaders of the church. They have a lot to learn. And they say, increase our faith. And his response is this, verse 6, if you had faith like a mustard seed, you would say to this mulberry tree, apparently while he's talking to them, there's a mulberry tree right here. Mulberry trees have these extensive root systems. And he said, if you had faith like a mustard seed, and a mustard seed was the s smallest seed in, in Palestine at that time. So if you had this tiny little bit of faith, you could say to this mulberry tree with these, this deep root system, be gone into the sea, and it would be uprooted, and it would be planted in the sea. Now, why would anybody want to do that? Does that accomplish anything? No, really. I mean, today you have people say, well, if you have faith as a mustard seed, if you give $10 to my ministry, you'll get $100 back, right? That's the way we see this applied today. He's not talking about the amount of faith. In fact, when, when they say, Lord, increase our faith, he denies the request, doesn't he? He doesn't say it's not about the amount of faith he's, because he says the smallest faith, the littlest faith, can do great things. Small faith, big things. He doesn't say, I'm going to make your faith bigger. He says, no, you take the faith that you have and obey. I think he's talking about obedience. He's talking about the faith that you have and obey and trust and depend upon God and good things and big things will occur because God will do them, not you and not your faith. It's him. It's always about him. It's always about his glory. Not a need for more faith, but obedience to the faith. And Jesus didn't answer their request. It's not about quantity. It's about quality. Because you, I can believe that I can step out off, off of this and float in the air, but I'm going to fall down. But Jesus is real. And the quality of faith and trust in the reality of Jesus and who he is and what he can do that is the object of our faith and where our faith is, is, is planted and where we depend upon and God will do things rather than the amount of our faith. Otherwise, if you're just ginning up more and more faith, that's nothing but positive thinking, right? Wishful thinking. So it's important for us to have our faith placed properly. So his response amounts to this. It's not a matter of 
a, a amount of faith that we're talking about, but the quality of faith in your obedience to it. So the lesson is this, and you know it well. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Trust is faith, and obedience is based upon faith. And that's, that's the Christian life. I mean, I, I'm always amazed. I've been, the, the more I grow in Christ, how this hymn is so, um, speaks so completely of the Christian life. You just trust and you obey in what you believe and what you know to be true. No other way. There's n- anything more to it than that. Trust and obey. So be dependent upon God. And the fourth one is to be faithful to God. Be faithful to him, verses 7 through 10. And he starts off in a typical fashion where he says, which of you would not do such and such? Which of you, having a slave plowing or tending sheep, will say to him when he has come in from the field, come immediately and sit down and eat? But will he not say to him, prepare something for me to eat and properly clothe yourself and serve me while I eat and drink? Afterwards you may eat and drink. Who wouldn't do that? Of course you would because that's the slave's job. And so he says in verse 9, he does not thank the slave because he did the things which were commanded of him, does he? It's like you're driving down the road going 35 miles an hour in Sprague and a policeman pulls you over and he says, I just want to commend you for driving 35. You're just doing what's expected of you, right? You don't go to work and at the end of the day the boss says, hey, I need to talk to you. I just want to thank you for coming in today. Get a paycheck for that, right? It's, it's what's required of you to go to work every day and to do your job, and so it is for disciples. It is required of stewards that one be found faithful. So he says in verse 10, So you too, when you do all things which are commanded of you by your Lord and Savior, you, what's your response? I'm, worthy, I'm unworthy of such mercy and grace. I've only done what God has asked me to do, and if he finds pleasure in that, then I'm an unworthy servant. That's the proper response to God's mercy and grace is humility. And we simply do what God has called us to do. Lesson is this. We are to serve Christ out of gratitude and for his glory, nothing more but he will reward you in the end. There is a reward, but you don't do it today expecting that you're going to get something today and somehow God, God owes you some special bla- blessing because you just simply obeyed what he called you, called you to do. Ephesians 6, 5 says, uh, Slaves, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling in the sincerity of your heart as to Christ. He's speaking to slaves of the day sincerely serve your master. Who is your master today? The Lord. And he says in verse 6, not by way of eye service as men pleasers, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, serving God. With good will render service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good thing each one does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether slave or free. Everyone does whatever they do, as to the Lord. It's what he's called us to do. It's our responsibility. He's the Lord. I'm his, sa- I'm his servant. He says, jump. I say, how high? Why? Because he's redeemed me, and I am to glorify him in my mortal flesh. And those who have received God's grace and mercy truly understand their own unworthiness before him, and we simply do what's required of us. The final thing that should be part of our expectation of the coming of the long-expected Jesus the second time is to be thankful to God. This is Thanksgiving weekend. And we have this brief story of these lepers that are cleansed. Be thankful to God. He was on his way to Jerusalem and passing between Samaria and and, uh, Galilee. This is the, the first geographical marker since chapter 10 and chapter 9 when he started off toward Jerusalem. And he's on his way, and these, he's entering this village, and these ten leprous men, they stood at him, and they call out to him because they're, they're, 
they are lepers and they can't come close because they're unclean. And if they are up w- or upwind, they have to be 150 feet away. And so they're calling out to him, Master, have mercy on us. This demonstrates the popularity of Jesus. He goes into obscure, an obscure town. People know who he is. They're expecting him to do these things and they know what he's capable of doing. They know him by reputation. They know that he's capable of great miracles. And they say, have mercy on me. And so when he sees them, he says, go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they were going to show themselves to the priests, they're cleansed. Their leprosy is gone. This is an amazing thing. Because leprosy was a disfiguring disease. And you were separated from the community. And you would... It was a death sentence, and they're cleansed. And to, to be cleansed uh, ceremonially, they would have to go to Jerusalem, and they'd have to go through this eight-day process. You can read all about it in Levit- Leviticus 14, and it's a, a long, drawn-out process just, just to be uh, certified as now clean and, and welcome back into the community. And they're cleansed, and this is this wonderful thing. And one of them, when he saw that he had been healed, he turned back, glorifying God with a loud voice, And he fell at his feet, on his face, right at his feet. So he was once far away, and now he comes close. And you can imagine, you know, his hands had been withered and flesh eaten away and his face and disfigured, and he was separated from, from people. And he's looking at himself, and he's going, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God, like people do today, and they don't mean it. And he meant it. Oh, my God, oh, my God. And he's giving praise and glory to God, and he falls at the feet of Jesus, recognizing that it is God who has worked through Jesus to heal him. And then as Luke says, he was a Samaritan. He was not only excluded through disfigurement and uncleanliness, but he was rejected by who he was. And now he's accepted wholly by the Savior. What a picture of salvation. And Jesus says, well, where are the other, weren't there ten, where are the other, the other nine? Wasn't one found, was no one found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner, this Samaritan? And he said, stand up and go, your faith has saved you. I know the New American Standard says made you well, but he's used one word for healing. He's used the word um, healing twice, I think, the word cleansed. And now he uses a different word, which is Salvation. Your faith has saved you. This one is saved by his faith. There was faith that cleansed him, and now there was faith that saved this one. This healing of the lepers is the the beginning then of this new section that looks to the coming of the kingdom of God because Jesus is going to be teaching about the, the expectation of Christ's return the second time, which is part of Come thou long expected Jesus. So, how do we live in expectation of his return? We live distinctive lives of discipleship. We live the lives of kingdom principles. We live expectantly and faithfully, and we live thankfully for all he's done. And that's how we should live this Advent season, lives of holiness and distinctiveness thankfulness and expectancy, expecting that long-expected one to come back to us. Amen? We're going to go to the Lord's table at this time, and so the men will be passing out the cup and the bread. And while they're doing that, I 